can I just say up front, it is actually part of standardizing the platform to make everybody a Paul. All right, so it's, it gives developers a, a, a reliable and convenient way to access developer relations if we just say everybody's a Paul. Um, so welcome to this session on the applied science of runtime performance. Uh, and by runtime, I kind of mean rendering. I basically mean anything that isn't page load. Um, as Jake said, I am one of the Pauls, and I work on the developer relations team. And normally I focus on both performance and design. And when I normally do my talks, I do these fairly theoretical, kind of architecture-based talks where I talk about pixel pipelines and you know architectures and how you get stuff on screen and blah, blah. No. This time I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to do an applied sciences talk. I'm going to step you through the process of building something from my point of view, my own personal journey, which is something of an experiment for me because uh, I don't normally sort of put this out there. And like all good experiments, sometimes they go a little bit wrong. But hopefully it won't. So we're stuck with it now, so let's find out. Hopefully by now most of you have seen this. It's the Chrome Dev Summit site. I designed and built the thing, and I set myself the... Oh. I can see this talk is going to go well. Um, I... I won't be covering like, the nitty gritty details of every aspect of it, but I wanted to step through the thing that gave me the most challenges and the most interesting thing that I could share with you on that journey. And it's this. It has this hero takeover effect with the cards. Okay, there we go. That's it on mobile. And because we're responsive, of course, this is it on desktop. Same kind of deal. Now, what I want to do, first of all, is I want to kind of step through what we call the natural way. So I think this is the way that most of us would think to solve this problem. We have a box that's moving on screen. It's getting bigger. So probably we think, right, let's do this with CSS, because we've heard that this is good for performance. So we'll transition on width, on height, on left, and on top. That seems like it'll do the job. Unfortunately, it gives us two problems. And we'll step through those very briefly. Firstly. Uh, let me show you this. This is a site I built a while ago called CSS Triggers. You can find it at CSSTriggers.com. And what you can do is you can find any given CSS property, and it will tell you what workload it triggers in the browser. So things like layout, paint, and composite, for example. And when we're building fast-performing sites, we want to trigger the least amount of work possible. Now, unfortunately for us, when we use left top width or height, we trigger layout, which is the geometric calculations of where everything is on the screen. We have to paint, filling in the pixels, and then we have to composite the page together. And basically, when you've got a reasonable-sized DOM, this is what the frames per second looks like. Now, if you can't see, let me zoom in for you. This here is the 60 frames a second line, which we're obviously aiming for. And you can see that when I transition on with height, left, and top, that essentially we're pretty close to that 60 frames a second line. And that's not good, because if we have garbage collection, or we have a freakishly long paint for some reason, um, then we're not going to hit fr the frame target, and we're going to stutter. So we're putting the browser uh, under strain every frame. So if you don't normally do the DevTools thing, I highly recommend this. Go into the DevTools, go to Timeline, hit Record, do whatever it is that you do, like scrolling or whatever, and look at the bars and just see how close you are. Are you going over the 60 frames a second line? Are you under? How far under? It's, a, it's the first line of defense to building a, a really nice, smooth experience. So that's one thing. We're pretty close to that frame budget. Here's the other problem. Changing width and height puts you into pixel-rounded kind of mode, um, which means that even if you're getting 60 frames a second, because things are moving per pixel, they actually look like they jitter a little bit. That's what it actually looks like to me. And I don't like that, uh, personally. I think it's very, it's jarring. It actually looks like it's jank, even though it's actually doing pretty well. By comparison, you get sub-pixel rendering when you change a transform. And this turns out to be quite useful for animations. So that's a thing about the platform. I don't know. So I want to talk about the, the unnatural way, or I'm going to call it the other way so I don't feel so weird about it, um, that I actually and the way that I actually end up building that effect. So I'll step through the, the outline of how, you, how I went about this. So it starts with this function here. Um, 
which is collecting the properties. So we're going to expand the card, which means we need to figure out what we know about the card. So collect properties, it takes uh, an object on which we're going to store all the things that we collect about um, the card. So what are we collecting? Well, first of all, we need to know what we're collecting on, and we collect on things like the title, the icon, the content, anything that's going to animate in the card, we need to track. And the collect properties looks like this. You see here I have the bit where I ask for the individual elements that I'm interested in tracking. And then I ask for things like the left and top and the width and the height of all those things, which I get through this, get bounding client rect, which if you've never used is brilliant because it gives you an object that looks like this with all the correct numbers in. And I have a disconcertingly large amount of love for this function because it is so unbelievably useful. So big thanks to the IE team because I believe that was IE4 that landed. Well, I never. Yeah, next week on esoteric functions. Um, okay, so once we've ca collected all the information about the card in its collapsed position, we now just expand it out completely to its final resting place, like so, like this. And we collect all the positions again. So now we know where you started, and we know where you finished. And of course, we've let the browser do all the work in the middle, like I don't say how wide or high, I just said, I asked the question, how wide and high? Uh, and I collect it. So it's, it's in this final position. And now I calculate where everything moved. Okay? And then I apply a transform to reverse it. So it looks like this. Ooh. Now, this all happens very quickly. You might not have seen this effect on the site because it doesn't happen like this. And you might look at this and you go, okay, it looks roughly in the right place, Paul, but there appears to be quite a lot of pink. That's right. But if we clip it, shazam. There we go. It's like it never happened, right? The good thing about this particular approach is now we're ready to rumble, because all we've got are transform and opacity changes that we've applied, and that means we're nice and compositor friendly. If you look at CSSTriggers.com and you type in transform, it'll go compositor. That's it. And compositor stuff typically is very fast today. So we switch on animations. And we, set, we just clear out all those transforms like this, like here. This is, the, this is the function that does it. Translate to nothing, scale to one, and go to your final opacity. And it gives us, oh yeah, we also animate the clip around the whole thing, by the way. Should mention that. Um, and it gives us the effect that we've come to know and love. And I think a, a, a good question at this point is, why are you doing it this way? It's like, it's like way more work, right? way more work, and you're right, and it is more work, and I, my hope is that the natural animations way will become faster, and as you heard this morning, we're, we're investing a lot of time and effort into making that a reality, um, but this is my journey through building this, and this is just the state of things as they are. Anyway, it is more work, and to kind of summarize my feeling, actually, there is a quote from John Gruber recently that I thought was excellent in this regard. He said, the point of making apps shouldn't be about making life easier for developers, in this case, me, it's about making the best possible apps for users, in this case, you. Um, so yes, it is definitely harder, but uh, you can encapsulate this into a web component and then never worry about it again and give it to other people, and they never need to worry about it again, which is like kind of what Polymer does, and it's pretty cool. And I generally think that performance matters, right? It matters to users, as we heard this morning with the, the, the takeover, the hero effect. Um, you know, users really feel it. They might not be able to say what it is, but they feel it, and it matters to them. They want something that feels great to use. So I think it's worth the, inv uh, the investment. Anyway, this way is actually faster than the other way. Let's look at ti uh, the timeline again. And you see now we're way lower in the middle. I say in the middle because the eagle-eyed amongst us will be saying, surely, Paul, this is bad. And uh, that's a fair question, I think. And so to answer that, I want to introduce you to what I call the Picasso principle which is this. Learn the rules like a pro so that you can break them like an artist. <laughs> it works for anything. Write it down. You can go back to your office. I'm, li I'm, like, I'm like an artist. I'm an artist. It works very well. You can be like, you can say, you know, Archimedes said, Jews will change sparingly. Um, <laughs> he didn't. But Picasso did say this. And uh, yes, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist, which is not to say I'm an artist, although I'm pretty handy with crayons. It's true, it's true. I actually drew this, and my son looked at it and went, Daddy, what is it? It's a picture. It's better than yours. 
Anyway, didn't say that, didn't say that. All right, so uh, these rules, right, that we're gonna break. They're not my rules, I don't really go in for rules, but they are things that you hear when you're learning web development. Um, and I, they, they come from a good place, they come from noble intentions, but I think we can break some. Let me show you what I mean. Rule number one, no frame should ever exceed 16 milliseconds. Right? It's, it's actually pretty good, because we want 60 frames a second. One second divided by 60 gives us 16 milliseconds. But it's actually not the whole picture. What I mean by that is this. When the user taps or clicks on something, we actually have 100 milliseconds in which to respond before the user goes, that didn't respond, did it? Um, so we've got 100 milliseconds that we bought, time-wise. The animation starts, the animation runs and ends. And then we have a little period at the end where we pick up the pieces and go, OK, before the user actually notices that the animation's ended, we've got this little window here. It's only this bit in the middle that needs to be 60 frames a second. So if we bring back that timeline snapshot, you'll see that it follows that pattern very closely. Um, the beginning where we do all the measurement stuff, all the toggling of classes and so on, that's that bar on the left, and it's roughly about 71 milliseconds on a Nexus 5. I memorized the number. It's not like I'm looking at the bar and I've got some freakish talent where I can tell you how long a frame was just by looking at the bar. Um, and then at the end, it's about 43-ish milliseconds. So we're inside that window, that model, of where you can say, actually, before I kick off an animation, if I have expensive work to do, I should do it now so I can run cheaply through the middle of the animation rather than going, on every frame, I should do expensive things because then you're much more likely to hit problems. So then, rule number one, no frame should exceed 16 milliseconds. No chance. Uh, of course, there are times, you know, you want to be 60 frames a second all the time. Of course you do. Why wouldn't you? Um, but there are times where it matters more than others, and during an animation is where it really matters to the user's experience, and that's the thing to concentrate on. You do have these little windows of opportunity during kind of idle time and so forth where you might be able to do expensive work and save yourself some hassle. By the way, uh, when I say animations here as well, scrolling should be considered an animation. Things are moving on screen. So don't, in that sense, treat scrolling as a separate thing. It should scroll at 60 frames a second, okay? So you might be wondering then, were there any other rules that you decided to break during this build, Paul? Yes, 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 indeed, there you are. Because I, I named that one rule number one, so it follows there may be other rules. Rule number two, never trigger a forced synchronous layout or layout thrashing. You may have heard it called that. Who would do such a thing? Um, let me show you the card expansion code again. So to recap, collect it in its collapsed position, expand it and collect again, calculate where we move to and reset it, switch on animations and go out again. The problem is in this section here, and particularly these two functions, because they set the transforms and opacities. Now, because of the way the browser is optimized, it defers those to the end of the frame. And unfortunately, the second one now stomps over the top of the first one, and it's kind of like the first one never happened. So we set our card to its expanded state. We then applied a transform that did nothing, and the net effect is no animations whatsoever. Boo-hoo, boo-hoo. What we need to do is we need to force the browser to realize that we set some styles before we start changing them again. And this is where the forced sync layout would help us. And to do that, we can add something like this, which asks for something like a width, a height, a padding, a margin, the bounding climb rectangle. Anything from CSS triggers that tell you it triggers layout would probably be enough to get this. So never, ever, ever force a sync layout? Never trigger one of those? You can call me Pablo. Does that sound, it works because I'm Paul, not because I'm an artist, although clearly I am. Um, th there, are, there are subtleties here that I knew, do need to call out. Firstly, I'm only doing this um, in that long running first frame. That 100 milliseconds that I have as a window, is, it, that's my opportunity to do this kind of work, as, as dangerous as and expensive as it might be. That's the time to do it. The other thing is I'm not doing it repeatedly, which would be very bad, because if I went read, write, read, write, read, write, that's causing the Chrome to do an awful lot. It's causing every browser to do an awful lot of things that you don't want it to do. OK, so caveats out of the way. So we're all, we're all, it's all plain sailing, right? No. Let's hit pause a second. There is a slight problem, and I want to show you. Again, this is all about my own 
kind of, it's quite cathartic, this, it's like therapy. Um, <laughs> there are, there, not everything is jank free. Um, you know, it's, things are miles better than they were, but there are times where it, it janks on every, every browser at some point, it does jank. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, this is occasionally in Chrome. You may have seen it stutter there. I'll do it in slow-mo. I'm just bear in mind that jank looks even worse in slow motion. Okay. Ah, oh, every time. Come on. I feel like it is my fault. That I should say that. Um, right. It's also bad in other browsers. Let me show you uh, in mobile Safari. Like that. It does that as well occasionally. So same kind of deal. Let me show you why that is. It's because of this line here. When I said I animated the clip that was around the box. Clip uh, triggers paint. Again, if we look back at CSS triggers, and we look at that, that's its profile there. It doesn't trigger layout, but it does trigger paint, and it does trigger compositing. So on non-Chrome browsers, it always causes jank. It always causes problems. And on Chrome desktop, it's typically fast enough to not be a problem. On Chrome and Android, it's only occasional. Um, and it's better when there's GPU rasterization switched on, in which case it is significantly better. So that's really nice. But to be completely honest, I was on the fence about the whole effect because maybe I should just kill it. Maybe I should just scale it back. And that's where I, it brings me to sort of rule number three, which is never sniff the user agent string. Don't, no, don't judge me. Don't judge me, all right? <laughs> We're all developing, we're all friends, right? Okay. Uh, the car JavaScript file, I have this flag in it, and it says run lo fi animations when you can't cope with fast clip animations, okay? Um, which is effectively a wraparound way of saying today, is it Chrome? I've named the function, I've named the function like this because my intention is to keep this up to date. My hope is that every browser will get better at dealing with clip animations. But right now, this is the state of things. And I don't just want to, you know, I, I just don't think clipping is something that people have really tried to do a lot of, whether it's overflow hidden, like animating these things. Um, but as these effects start to open up to us, which they are doing, then we're going to try more and more of these things. And that's a really interesting place for us to be. So this is what it looks like on desktop Safari. It's the same on uh, mobile Safari as well. See that? There we go. And it's no bad thing, actually. It runs well. It does the effect nicely. And I think this, for me, was the important distinction. When, like when I was sort of reasoning this out to myself, is that I don't use it to redirect you to an M dot site or to say, no, you can't have the thing. What I'm trying to do is trying to just give you something, but because I'm confident that you can't have the fast clip animations, I don't want to, I just don't want to ruin your experience. Um, so for me, that's kind of how I've thought about this. Um, so I think in very specific circumstances, you might you might feel OK about UA sniffing, but then I would say that, given that's what I did, right? So you may disagree, and I'm 100% cool with that. I think um, the question, though, for me, or maybe, why even leave it in if it's not perfect everywhere, Paul? What were you thinking? And I, I want to explain why I did. Firstly, I think it's important to push boundaries. It's partly my job, but it's also partly what I think we need to do as an industry. We need to find out where the boundaries are. We need to say, this is the kind of thing I want to make Ugh, and push. I think that's a good idea. I think the web deserves those great user experiences. And I think you can act as something of a signpost as well. Like, these are the kind of things you can do on the web. Secondly, it does hit 60 frames a second. I'm quite tough on myself. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Uh, on desktop, it runs very well. On mobile, it typically runs uh, well as well. It's just occasionally. Uh, I believe it will get significantly better, not only through GPU rasterization in Chrome, but I think every browser vendor has, has got very smart people working on these kinds of problems. Um, and lastly, but not leastly, I like giving Chrome engineers headaches. Uh, why is this slow? Um, I'm kidding, of course. Or am I? <laughs> uh, one thing I want to say about all this, those rules, or any received wisdom, is if you decide to go against it for whatever reason, um, you're responsible for it. In the same way, I'm now responsible for the Chrome Dev Summit site. And you know, if, if browsers fix their performance issues in this area, I will have to keep that function up to date. That's my responsibility, and I believe that's the responsibility we have. Um, it's important that we make sure that our stuff 
does the most that it can, and we don't just sort of launch and forget. So I think that's something that I really wanted to kind of call out. Um, so yeah, I will be keeping that code up to date because it's not future facing, so I have to drag it into the future with me. <laughs> okay, cool. So <laughs> a guided tour through building this. Just that. Just that. There we go. It's great. So I wanted to cover um, off a few other bits and pieces, sort of related to the site, but also sort of related to the whole sort of runtime rendering stuff that I think is helpful. Let's talk about debugging animations for a second. It's hard, isn't it? Good news. Um, right, this is pretty fast, right? Ta da. If it runs, it's going to run. Yeah, OK. It's pretty fast. There's a good experimental feature that we're on the process of making here um, in DevTools. Yeah. And I can go in and I can switch down the, the global playback speed here of, of the animations. And hit that. Wait, wait. I'm gonna, yeah, gonna pause it now because I, I want to do that. I just want to pause it. Just wait there. Hold off. And then, yeah, come on. And then I can inspect the element itself, which I think is this one. And it tells me all the animations that are currently on that and its children. And as I roll over each one of those, it's going to show me which element it's referring to. I can dive into one. I can scrub it back and forth. <laughs> and I can also inspect the actual properties at that point and so say, what values do you have? Now, this is not um, ready just yet. It's experimental. We wanted to give you a bit of a sneak peek, show you what's coming down the wire. We know that debugging animations is hard, and we're doing a lot of work to make it far easier. So. That's going to be a lot of fun. Next thing, um, Alex actually mentioned this earlier, but I did wanted to call it out. The site will run when you're offline. Now, at this conference, the Wi-Fi is really good. At not every conference have I been to, that I could say the same thing. And so for me, a conference site that works offline is actually really quite useful. Um, and of course, it is because of service worker. Um, now, Alex did a great job of, of kind of talking you through all that stuff earlier, but I did want to kind of add, it, you know, add my own little bit that I am using it. Um, it's a kind of a, let's call it an app cache replacement. I don't know. Um, it's, it's about resilience for bad Wi-Fi um, and fast bootstrapping of the site rather than anything more adventurous. And it, it's really quite simple on the inside. On a fetch, uh, I basically say, do you have something in the cache? If yes, return it. If no, go and fetch it. And then when you've got your answer back, assuming we can cache it, cache it, and then return it. It's pretty simple. And uh, I kind of like it. Another reason I really like Service Worker, personally speaking, is this. I think historically we've been in a situation where we've been very network bound. It's like having to install an app every time you want to use the app, right? And I, I don't know about you, but when I have a native app open that does pretty similar things, and I'm trying to decide which app I want, I don't go, you know what? This was 3.2 megabytes from the Play Store. This was four. I can't deal with it. No, no, no. I, I, I basically say, look, this has a better user experience. It's got a better design. It's got a better feel to it. I like this one more than I like this one, OK? I think that's an important distinction. Service Worker has the potential to give us these fast bootstrapping, fast launching experiences. Now, I should say that it doesn't do away with the network concerns we've had so far because you know, you've still got that first load where you need to get your Service Worker in place. But the, the future, the, the sort of second time onwards, then it starts to get a lot, lot better. And I think for me, that shift of saying, you know what, like when two things, two sites or two apps, web apps, do similar things, the differentiator becomes the runtime. How well does, it, does this thing perform? How well does it, is it designed? And what's its user experience like? I think that's really cool. Other thing that people have mentioned to me in the past is that it's very difficult to kind of figure out out in the wild how you're doing from a frames per second point of view. So it's OK. You've got DevTools timeline. And that's great for your machine. And maybe you get a little bit of stuff going on in your device lab if you've got one. Great. But what can I do when I've got you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users out in the wild? Well, this is where the frame timing API could help us. Now, just to warn you, it's, it's in sort of spec state at the moment. It's being discussed by the W3C. So bear that in mind. This is the W3C repo, which has this address, 
from W3C, frame-timing. There's an explainer doc there. There is the uh, latest uh, draft of the spec. Uh, so you can go and dive into that and figure out um, you know, a little bit more. But I want to give you the kind of elevator pitch for what, uh, what you get with it as it stands. So there are these renderer or main thread events. So main thread is where your JavaScript runs, where style calculations are done, where layout is done. And you can ask for these records. And each one that comes back looks a little bit like this. There's a unique number for each frame. It has a start time, and it has a CPU time. Now, you could use this to kind of step up. Say if you've got an array of these, does the start time go up in 16 or so millisecond intervals? If so, I have something that runs on the main thread at about 60 frames a second. But more than that, with the CPU time, I can figure out how comfortably or not I was doing this. If I have a CPU time of near 60 milliseconds, I'm really close to that boundary, aren't I? And, and I, there's not a lot that might push me over. Okay? Whereas if I've got low CPU time, then I'm, I'm making it with ease. And with lower CPU time, of course, hopefully becomes lower battery drain as well as a bonus. So you get a lot of information just from these three things. But you can also ask for compositor events from this as well. So with the compositor thread uh, on uh, Chrome on Android, that's where the painting and rasterization, well, depends where the GPU raster is on. That's where painting happens, and it's where compositing happens. And the events for that look like these. Again, they've got the same frame number system. And given the way compositing works, sometimes there are multiple composites per main or renderer thread event. And so you can tie them back with this number. How many, you know, I've got a bunch of these for 120. Tie them back. They also have the start time as well. Um, there is some discussion, I believe, on, as to whether there should be CPU time here as well. So if you feel strongly either way, that's what the GitHub repo is for. That's what the issues are for. Go and make your voice be heard. So I, it would take a while for me to explain exactly what you could do with all this. Um, but here's some ideas. You could track the frames per second of your JavaScript and your CSS animations. You could figure out, hey, when a video is playing, the side nav bar doesn't run very well. You could track your scrolling performance. OK, on, uh, you know, it scrolls fine on our machines here, but for whatever reason, on these devices over here, it doesn't scroll well. You could beacon that data back to analytics. So on aggregate, you could start figuring out that people in a particular part of the world are using a device that you don't have in your lab. Now would be a good time to go and buy that and fix the issues that they have, and you can start doing this. Uh, much more broadly. And then lastly, you can automate and you could alert on regressions. The new person joins the team. They're well-meaning. They add will change to everything. Everything collapses. And you go, what happened? Hopefully, you can catch that early before you deploy. Get in. So frame timing API. Uh, I think that's really exciting. I'm really looking forward. I hope this ships. Uh, it's just, I just wanted to give you the heads up that it's something that's being discussed. <laughs> Right, coming back to the site, there is one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, it's open source. Uh, you can learn from my mistakes, my successes, and I would love for you to do that. Um, the code is as neat and tidy as I can muster, but it's not bad. You know. um, please do take a look. It is on GitHub, Google Chrome, Dev Summit. Uh, there was another commit I did this morning, which fixed a, a, a bit of an issue. You know, I'm keeping an eye on it. Uh, you know, they're interesting things. Main things I would look at personally are the card.js file and the service worker. Two really interesting bits. But there are interesting things in there about how I manage URLs. Um, so I'll leave that one as a bit of a tempter. Go and have a look. It's, it's really cool. So to finish up, um, I guess my journey, the conclusions I drew from it were that you should push boundaries. Um, like I said, the web, I believe, deserves these fantastic user experiences. It deserves us pushing really hard on this. Good performance, though, isn't always easy. And we are doing a lot to try and make it easier, to try and make that natural animations way just the way that you do things so that you don't have to keep in your head all these different ways of doing things. It isn't easy, but it is absolutely always worth it. I, I take from the, the clap that you gave me earlier, which I really appreciate, that you like the site. And so for me, I can now tell you for definite, it was worth it. Because as I would always say, performance matters, as you show me. Thank you. <laughs>